know, people are constantly raising the bar. Sacrifices need mm. to be made. What would you guys say are your biggest weaknesses? You or your enemy right now? It's success of life. Just a fucking podcast. Hey guys, welcome to the Student Side Hustle. This week I'm speaking to Steve Hall. He is a podcast host, a content creator, and a bodybuilder and a bodybuilding coach. Steve, how did you get into this? How did this all start? Cool, yeah. Thank you very much for having me on, James. Uh, it's a real pleasure of mine. I am used to being on the other side, so uh, it's not kind of one of my typical things to be talking <laughs> as much as I probably will be today, but yeah. um, thank you for the opportunity for that. So for myself personally, the way I got into kind of the fitness scene really it stems from like a young age yeah. when i was just at school i think i was just into everything like i wanted to do everything yeah. um i even played football or soccer i think it is actually in yeah. new zealand um to quite a high level uh, yeah. which was awesome um and i've always been kind of one of those kind of shyer people who mm. i played football but i was never like the typical footballer like a bit of a lad and all yeah, of that yeah, i was yeah. more so the quiet guy um, the one that probably took a lot of the hits <laughs> because people could like hack me down and I wouldn't really right, do much. I was right. a bit too polite for that. Yeah. Um, so yeah, this is that kind of tells you a bit about my character. And then mm. when I was at university, I actually, and when I went through kind of my studies through school, I ended yeah. up putting PE and that sort of physical education to the side, even though I was kind of good at it in many ways. Mm. Um, because the type of person that was actually studying that sort of thing just wasn't my type of person. In fact, yeah, like yeah. I was bullied at mm. school. So this is something I just, I was like, I'm going to do art and I'm going to do like geography and I'm going to do these yeah. sort of subjects. So I ended up going to university. And whilst I was at university, I was studying geography with business. So nothing related to really what I do now, apart from maybe the business side helps me a little bit. Yeah. Um, and whilst I was there, I did like rowing club. I did play football a little bit. I still went to the gym and whilst I was at school, I kind of vaguely went to the gym and did like, I remember my split was like cables and then like dumbbells and then like <laughs> sprints on the treadmill. Yeah. Uh, it was just all over the place as I mean, many people are. Yeah. And I really didn't know what I was doing with nutrition at all. This was when like, I remember after my workouts, I would hide protein powder like in my <laughs> in my locker and go to the changing rooms and go to the toilet and drink it whilst my friends couldn't see me having it. Because really? I thought, oh, if I have this edge with my friends, <laughs> like, I'll, I'll get all the gains and they're like, I'll, they'll be sitting behind. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. in fact, I did progress more than a lot of my friends, but it wasn't yeah. down to the protein shakes or anything yeah. along those lines. It was just the pure consistency mm. and like hard work and just wanting to go in there. Yeah. Um, and that is where a lot of successful bodybuilders will start from yeah. so anyway whilst i was at university i was actually on one of these kind of 10 kilometer runs that i would typically typically do yeah. in my second year and i was on for like an all-time pb i had like my garmin heart rate monitor on yeah. and i could see that like i was about uh, beating my shadow it used to have like a shadow <laughs> which is really cool yeah. and i don't run at all now so it's funny thinking back to it yeah and i came to a crossing and it was flashing amber and I just went and then I looked right and there was a van and I got hit by a van, um, which sounds really traumatic. And it, it was. But when I think back to it now, it's kind of something I can laugh at because I'm fully recovered from it. Yeah. But that incident caused me to have quite a severe head injury, which yeah. um, caused a fractured skull. I have scarring that I have for life now. Hmm. But I also suffered a blow to the pituitary gland and yeah. uh, they think it bruised. And that's like a bit of a control center for many different hormones. So I ended up finding that I was uh, constantly low on sodium. Yeah. And so that led to a risk of kind of having a seizure mm. when you're very low on electrolytes and if they're imbalanced, you can yeah. be in a really bad way. So I was actually in hospital for uh, almost a month until yeah. they kind of recovered. And then I was monitored. So I was getting blood tests like every week. I was on a water limit of 250 mils a day, Holy which shit. thinking to that now, I can like that's drink nothing. that in a second. Yeah. And yes, yeah, absolutely not. So that's a coffee. So yeah. I, I can even remember missing kind of having milk on my cereal, just the little things that you just don't even consider. And I don't eat soup to this day because mm. it's something that I just couldn't eat for a long period of time. Mm. Um, and watermelon, I can remember <laughs> overdoing <laughs> it on watermelon one time and feeling like crap the next day because... I basically flushed out a lot of the electrolytes. Yeah, uh, I was also on medication during that period of time to try and kind of get my balance in place. And it, it took about a year for that all to level out. And once I was actually recovered from that kind of low sodium aspect, I realized that there are other things that weren't right with me. And that was, I was a little bit depressed. 
Yeah. I'd also been gaining kind of fat in unfavorable places. I baby basically had like man boobs, yeah. um, and I actually developed gynecomastia as well. Um, but I didn't realize it was gynecomastia at the time. Yeah. I just realized I had hard nipples, basically, yeah. which sounds hilarious. But I had lumps under my nipples, yeah. which is basically because my estrogen levels were way out of balance to my testosterone. And that was only found because I went to my doctor and he was like, you need to get a kind of test. And they did what they do for like babies with the, the gel and the, the like ultrasound. ultrasound. Yeah. So I had that done on my nipples and they're like, yeah. it's just kind of yeah. uh, And they tested my testosterone and it was very low. So I needed to go on a short course of testosterone replacement therapy, or at least yeah. um, they thought it was going to be a short course. Yeah. Or No, wait, I didn't know if it was going to be a short course. It was a short course. They yeah. weren't sure. Yeah, yeah. During all of this time, I was still after my accident kind of um, kind of feeling a bit lost and unsure in what I could pursue because I love yeah. sport. I come from that background of loving it. And I didn't want to run anymore because mm. it kind of felt like I was out of control in that aspect. Yeah. I didn't want to play sports with other people anymore. Mm. I actually lost my social life a lot because mm. I couldn't drink very much. So I couldn't even drink alcohol when I was at university. And that's kind of a big social element for people. Yeah. So I did actually find the gym again. And then I ended up reading up on kind of bodybuilding forums and like how to bulk. And I just ended up overfeeding massively. And I gained a lot of weight during this period of time. So whilst my health wasn't in good nick, I was also yeah. trying to better my health yeah. by like bulking up. And I do what I, I, I did what I would call a folk. And that's kind of like <laughs> a fat bulk. Yeah. Is um, that like a dirty, and, filthy bulk? Yeah. I mean... In my eyes, it is. Back yeah. then, I thought I was doing a clean bulk because I was like, oh, I'm just eating clean foods. <laughs> but I was eating like 4,000 calories, volume, weighing yeah. it, yeah, yeah. 130 pounds. Yeah. So I ended up putting on 60 pounds during mm. quite a Holy short period of time. That's a lot of weight. Yeah. So I was kind of regaining some of the weight that I lost just during hospital because yeah. I went in at 11 stone, which I can't remember <laughs> what that is in pounds, and came out like I, I lost two stone whilst in hospital. So I lost like a lot of weight. So like yeah. 25 pounds. So I gained all that back quite quickly and then more so. Mm. So yeah, I was kind of in this state of low testosterone, kind of a bit fat and not feeling great. And then yeah. finding out that I had to go on kind of testosterone replacement therapy. Yeah. And so I went on this, it was this gel that I would rub on my chest. Yeah. And that ended up bringing up my testosterone levels to normal. It absolutely changed my life. Yeah. And I felt so much better for it. Yeah. During that period of time, I also realized that there must be a better way to do this kind of gym thing and this yeah. eating thing and i ended up researching more and i found la mcdonald yeah. and bodyrecomposition.com which is just like the one of the best resources online that there possibly is for yeah. kind of body recomposition for fat yeah. loss muscle gain and then i also found alan aragon who mm. is kind of like the godfather of nutrition for a lot of um the people in our niche at least yeah and i used used their <laughs> concepts and kind of fitting macros and making sure I had plenty of protein and yeah. getting to calorie deficits, calorie surpluses. I started mm. learning about these things and using them for my own physique. And along with kind of having better health in terms of like testosterone being within normal range, yeah. I sort of started seeing results and yeah. I started feeling really, really good. Yeah. And at this time, I also started to discover someone who you just uh, interviewed, yeah. Eric Helms, yeah. and I discovered 3DMJ yeah. through Matt Ogus, actually, who at oh, the yeah. time I, I think he still is quite big on YouTube. Yeah. Um, cause he was being coached by Eric Helms. Oh, yeah. So I found some of their content and I started thinking, man, like, I want to do natural bodybuilding. That seems really cool. Mm. But I was on this testosterone replacement therapy, which is not natural and yeah. you can't compete whilst taking that. Yeah. So I asked my doctor, can I come off this? Uh, because I don't want to be on this medication long term. I want to yeah. compete naturally. And he was like, right, let's trial. Let's see how you do. Mm. Came off it. I managed to sustain love. <laughs> seven years now um i haven't been on the testosterone replacement therapy hmm. so with all of that said that kind of then led me to want to compete and so i reached yeah. out to lots of organizations to see whether they would let me compete considering i'd taken a bad banned substance in the past yeah and two out of the three i contacted were all for it and they were fine hmm. uh, one of them didn't even discuss it with me they were like no black and white so yeah that's fine um and then i decided to kind of compete and during that period of time as well i was working in london yeah um, and i was doing an office job there in merchandising and i found uh, whilst i was doing that i studied personal training on the side because again mm. it was kind of 
like I was, it was like scratchy and itch. I wasn't sure if I was going to go down that line in yeah. the future. Um, and eventually I decided, right, I'm going to go all in. I'm going to yeah. actually go work as a PT. So I, I was still living at home so I could take this risk, work as a PT in my home gym. And at the same time, I was going through this contest prep. Yeah. So during that time, I just learned tons about myself, about how to train others. And I personal trained one-on-one for about a year. Um, and during that time, I also competed for the first time in 2014. Mm. Whilst doing all of this, I was documenting my journey on YouTube. I have some old horrendous videos. <laughs> so I was kind of building a bit of a social media online platform kind of there. Yeah. And I was garnering a lot of interest from uh, the younger kids who kind of trained at the same gym that yeah. I PT'd at. Yeah. And they could see me like getting shredded and um, lifting heavy weights and getting results that they weren't getting. And they were like, mm. I want some of this. Now, yeah. they didn't want one-on-one -on -one PT. Yeah. Uh, they just wanted programming for their nutrition, for right. their training. They just they, they knew how to like squat. They knew how to deadlift. They yeah. just needed guidance and how to make that even better and more productive. So I started working with some of the guys in the gym for really cheap, charging hardly anything, yeah. and got amazing results. When they stuck to it, like these guys, yeah. I was getting ridiculous results for some of these people. Mm. Uh, Along with obviously myself getting competition photos and everything, the online side just started building and mm. growing. And I got to a point where I had tapered off my one-on-one -on -one PT and yeah. I built up my online side. So I was slowly transitioning out of the one-to-one -one PT. And there became a chance for me to actually move in with the girlfriend who I'd met during my time working in London. Yeah, And this was like a big risk for me. I had yeah. to kind of try and sustain an income with online coaching we're off a few number of clients and so mm. I just went all in I was like I want to move into London I don't want to live at home anymore and I just started plowing everything into the business uh, and I went through like a few names so I started out my YouTube channels like the fitness hub yeah. I went to revive with Stephen Hall and now I've kind of become revive stronger yeah uh, in that time I've had three different websites and I've been producing content for years and it's kind of a lot of people don't see all of this that's happened yeah and that all happened. Um, yeah. So that, that's where Revive Stronger came from. And I, yeah. I, the reason the, the story is quite important is because that's where the name came from. So yeah. it's kind of like I'd come from ground zero, basically. Mm. And I built myself up to compete on a bodybuilding stage. Yeah. And for me to have gone through all of that and had such bad health, I felt like yeah. I want to help everyone else do this. There's mm. people in the world who really struggle with their health. And you, like they don't know what to do. And I want to help them. And part of that was also a lot of the kids in the gym that I trained at, they were looking towards steroids yeah. or spending silly money on supplements. Yeah. And they didn't even understand how much protein they should have mm. or mm. that they should look to train harder and stick like to something. They didn't have the base level. Like they had the adherence, but they didn't have the base knowledge of that, that triangle. I mean, yeah, they, they, you fall into a trap where if you don't learn anything as a new trainee, you kind of get those novice gains, yeah, you get the new yeah. gains, then you get intermediate. And if you don't have any idea really what you're yeah. doing with the nutritional training, it doesn't matter what you do. Yeah. If it's not directed sufficiently, that's what you're happened just to me, I believe, so, because yeah. I, I started off at like 53 kilos or something. I gained like 10 kilos, I gained heaps because I was fucking nice. tiny. Right. And then I got to like 63 and I plateaued for like a whole year. And then I started following people like you, like 3DMJ, AJ Morris. And now I've literally broken my plateau. And I think it was just a knowledge plateau, which is really weird. But so basically, I, I think I basically reached a knowledge and a calorie plateau. And I'm not really right, sure. Yeah. Like basically for me, I have to eat like a ton of food to gain weight. And I'm still like decently, like, like currently I'm weighing in at 71 kilos. And I'll eat like er everything, everything under the sun. Like, I, it, there's not a chance I'll gain body or... I, I, like I've gained a little body fat, but it's like I don't think I'm at the point yet where I'm heavy enough to have to put on a significant amount of body fat. I'm just going by like a kilo per per two or three weeks. That's like current nice. the current thing. Just trying to like actually get get the scale up there, and then like then then sort of judge it. But how did you transition from like what made, what made you start to want to like? make podcasts and make stuff like that because it's like mm -hmm. for me it was quite it was almost an obvious decision for me because i was making blog posts i was making but i hated writing so it was obviously like and then i was also making youtube videos and 
Like I still make a few YouTube videos when I like almost just like a, as a real, real side side hobby. But like the podcast is the main thing. It's like that's the thing that I really want to. One is one thing that I must keep consistent. The one thing that must keep going up. What was the rationale for you behind like? Okay, I want to start doing podcasts. I want to start creating content. Like, what made you do that? Cool. No, yeah, I mean, I I love social media. I love producing mm. content. Um, and I started off with the YouTube, and I started off with blog posts. Yeah. So I I, I did look. I mean, the website has tons of blog posts on it, and I had other blogs before I even had this one with some terrible advice on there probably which I completely disagree with now yeah. uh, but that's that's part of learning that's and becoming a better practitioner yeah. Um, but yeah with the podcast it was really actually because I brought on another coach <coughs> and I wanted people to get to know him and get to know how much knowledge he had yeah. and so I wanted to discuss topics with him and then kind of produce that for people so it was more content and to get his name out there and for people to see us because I think with the online PT world a lot of the face and the personal element is lost and so I wanted to bring that back I wanted people to have a reason to pick Revive Stronger as their coach yeah and then it really exploded and it didn't this was complete coincidence because I invited Mike Isretel to come over for a seminar yeah um years ago now for the first one we're just about to do the third one now because I saw you guys making those t-shirts yeah, yeah, so we've got the third one happening in a, just over a week now. Yeah. So this was after the first one. We basically had a load of uh, backlog questions. And I yeah. was like, Mike, do you mind coming on a podcast to answer these questions? And yeah. then he, he was like, yeah, sure. And we did it. And then I was like, we've still got some questions left over. Would you come on again? And yeah. he was like, yeah, sure. I was like, can we make this a thing? Can you be <laughs> like, Mike, Dr. Mike, do the Q&A? And he was like, sure. And then that's where it all began. Yeah. And it's crazy to think about that because I had no idea those episodes would be so popular. Yeah. And now they're getting te- like thousands of views. Yeah. And people love the Q&As with Mike. And yeah. I love talking to Mike. And yeah. we've kind of developed quite a cool little relationship and bond over it. Yeah. And then because I got the confidence with Mike, yeah. I then I knew people like Eric Helms. Yeah. I'd been to seminars run by him, Brad mm. Schoenfeld, mm. Uh, James Krieger, all of these different people. And I was like, I'm going to just ask if they come on the podcast yeah. and then they uh, they do yeah that's and the crazy thing now it's got to a point where i've interviewed so many experts i feel like if they're in the niche and they yeah. kind of are uh, know of them they're yeah. probably know of the podcast mm. so it's almost it's almost it's like really nice it would ring a bell or you can just say i've had these people on and it's sort of like i feel like it's like positive reformation for me it was sort of like yeah if you know josh bridgman and tm cycles I feel like when I, when I got them on, that was like the sort of the start of it for me was like getting into the bodybuilding niche and being like, hello, I'm not just some kid trying to like put bad media into the bod- podcast. I mean, the bodybuilding like niche and sort of like mm-hmm. legit- legitimizing myself. Like, yeah, I feel like once you've got like one guest on, that's like, hey, it was a great episode. And it was like, once you've done that, it's like that can sort of steamroll into more and more quality episodes. And it's like, I just love how that that whole like dynamic works. And it, it's quite hard because, I mean, when I first started the podcast, we didn't really have, like I ended up getting people like Andy Morgan on. I don't know if you know him from ripbody.com, uh, yeah. which you might know. It's a huge website. But anyway, he's, yeah. he's a great guy. Yeah. Uh, he's a practitioner himself. But we more so talked like business. Right. And uh, Mike, Mike Vacanti, you might know, actually. He was Gary Vee's personal trainer oh, yeah, for a yeah. period of time. So yeah, I had him on and I ended up realizing, actually, I want to go hyper-focused into yeah. bodybuilding. Yeah. So now I, I want to be the number one bodybuilder podcast that do the, the kind of steroid using side better. Yeah. But if I can like dial into that niche, it's what I love. It's what our clients want to learn about. Yeah. Uh, and I think that'll draw better people because yeah, I think there are a lot of podcasts now and yeah. because it's so easy to really get it yeah. going, I think you have to be quite clever about being a good interviewer uh, yeah, and then definitely. getting the right content out to your audience yeah i do actually have, have questions about your about how you facilitate positive conversation with with expert, experts because you speak to a lot of experts but one thing that i'd really really like to touch on now is for a little background i have scoliosis so basically okay. curved spine and then i've also had the spinal fusion so it's from t3 to l2 so wow. it's a pretty big spinal fusion it's pretty pretty intense but basically during life, during lifting, I have to basically take into account and like think about it rationally and not just 
it's something that I have to take, take into account before I go and say, okay, should I do a one RM on deadlift? Like, no, no, I shouldn't. And it, just things like that, that I had to sort of take into account. For you with your injury and with your damage, was it to your pituitary gland? Yeah. Yeah. So like with your injury and with your damage to that, how does, because a lot of my listeners do have scoliosis and they sort of had to okay. facilitate that. And I don't know if you know Mo Samuels, he's got lymphedema and it's sort of a similar, it's, it's a similar sort of thing. Basically he has to, he basically, if he ever wanted to do steroids, no, like you, you just can't with lymphedema and it's sort of something that with his lifting as well, that he has to take into account, like he can't stand up all day and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. So how for you have you found that your injury has affected your daily life? Like, and how does it con- continue to nowadays? And how does it, mm-hmm. how do you sort of have to modify your lifting compared to others even nowadays? Yep. So I think, I mean, incredible that you're lifting through that and that you've had that spinal mm. fusion and you're doing everything because uh, I, think I can only imagine option. how hard that can be. Because the thing that really I think would be the worst decision, and it's, it's hard for me to say from a point of having such a great surgeon and having such an amazing outcome, I had a 50 degree curve and now it's fucking zero or wow. like five or something. And I'm like almost not like, I feel almost normal, like mm-hmm. 90%. I have a lot of like imbalances and a lot of like, like this shoulder comes forward, this one's flat fine my right erector is like non-existent my left my no, no my left uh, my left lat left erector not there like they just don't exist right the, my right erector is literally a tree trunk and then it's like it's it, it's crazy how much like that can be a thing but the thing that like it feels like for me lifting with scoliosis like say if you do cardio right cardio is great good that's great for your heart and like, it's great for your general just bodily systems but i think that lifting it, it it feels different for me because you can take control of so many aspects like it has so many effects on so many different things even if you're not bodybuilding like bodybuilding yeah i think it's more like just aesthetics but even just doing like bare bones lifting without even going for progressive overload like just get yeah. in there twice a week and do bench squat deadlift or anything because i think it's like so many people with scoliosis are scared to do anything and they and like the mm-hmm. moment they start doing it it just completely changes their perception because yeah. that's one thing that i really really want to hear you talk about is the thing that i love so much about the gym is you can create control every single aspect like when say in football you can't control the person that's going to slide tackle your knee and break your acl like you can't you can't control that so how have you, how have you found that being able to control the aspects and being able to look after what you're actually doing and like figure out okay if i need a rest day cool like if i need to never do this one exercise cool how have you sort of Mm -hmm. found that with your injury so i think yeah i mean my injury is a little bit different to yours in that Mm. the physical outcomes quite there yes my physiology has changed in that yeah. i don't manage my electrolytes as well and yeah. i don't have high testosterone levels as maybe i would have if yeah. i didn't have the injury so really in reality i think i the thing i fight with is kind of seeing that maybe i could have better progress right if right. i had like higher normal testosterone levels. like it doesn't feel like you're or, like fighting with a disadvantage like it's like kind of yeah, yeah i think it i think for a lot of people it's it's frustrating being a practitioner and a coach and someone who puts out social media content yeah. because people look towards your physique and mm. they almost see that and then they equate that with knowledge and yeah. it's not right. Yeah. And I'm not to say that I don't have a, a good physique because I definitely have, but yeah. I work my absolute ass off for it. Mm. I actually try and kind of the adherence and consistency that I've had to have is probably yeah. even greater than maybe yeah, someone definitely. else who hasn't gone through what I've gone through. Mm. Um, and But I love it and I think you yeah. have to. And you have to know your own limits and you have to understand biology and the yeah. fact that, I mean, the, th- the thing I love about the human body is just the fact it is just incredible. Like yeah. you, like you had your spinal fusion and then your body's kind of like, oh, we're now in line. I can be like good. Yeah. And it's the same with mine. Like how would it, I don't know how my body recovered its own yeah. kind of ability to manage my sodium intake um, and things like this, my electrolytes, like it is nuts. And I think yeah. if you treat, and this is what made me really get a large passion for, health and kind of seeing people throw away their health and maybe yeah. someone who had the accident i had they might have been like ah like this is awful i'm just gonna eat crap and like, mm, like mm. life's terrible that's, that's whereas i saw it's like 
yeah I, mm. I mean you now have the opportunity mm. to have a really healthy life and you yeah. might not be as healthy if you didn't go through what you've gone yeah. through but that but like, is what it is and now I think you it's control kind of every like variable the you fact can. that you have it's like okay the way i like to think of life is literally like okay what aspects can you control cool focus on those if you can't control it doesn't matter push yeah. it away like it's just like if it, it doesn't matter like if you cannot control it doesn't matter at all like maybe give it some emotional thought but in my opinion like nearly ignore it and that's why i love the gym and i love yeah. bodybuilding because it made me feel very much in control of my body because i could manipulate my nutrition i yeah. could manipulate my macronutrient intake i could mm -hmm. manipulate my training variables and cardio and calorie input and output yeah. and see change and be like, wow, I am now in control of my body, whereas before yeah. I was out of control and felt really bad about that. Mm. And it just developed a lot of confidence. And that's why I wanted to give it to other people because I think, like you said, when you're an intermediate and you kind of hit that plateau, you yeah. kind of feel out of control. You're like, what is going on? Why can't I see what I want to see happen? Yeah. And it's like many like women typically, they go through lots of diets and they're like, I can't lose weight. Like you're, the amount of women you're here, I can't lose weight. And you're like, yeah. you can, you just have to set yourself up in an environment yeah. that will produce that. And you, they need the grounding education behind it. Otherwise they yeah. just will never stick to it. Yeah. It's kind of like, they're always looking for that shortcut. Like a lot of intermediates look towards using steroids. Yeah. So they're like, Oh, that must be the answer. Think, Everyone's on steroids. Like literally I thought a year and a half in, it was very, very naive now that I think about it. I'm almost embarrassed to say, but I thought I was at my genetic peak. A year, a year, yeah. a year and a half into lifting, like for fuck's sake, like no, like just because it, it just got way harder to gain muscle, and it's like, mate, just eat more, like, and it was it was literally that simple, like, and I, I was yeah. thinking, oh, I didn't need to do all these advanced training techniques, and that's how I found people like 3DMJ, like you, like AJ, cool. like, like all all these things that I was trying to get super super advanced, but like I didn't have the basics down. And do you find yeah, that I think sort of consistent? Like a lot of people don't get the basics down. A hundred percent. And even with myself, I was very similar to you in that I literally could look like Matt August to me when I was first finding him, I was like, there's no way you can be natural. Yeah. Right. Whereas now I look at him and I'm like, yeah. like, of course he could be like, it actually yeah. it makes sense that he would be because yeah. he's been lifting for this long. He has yeah. good, like pretty good genetics. He, he like, he knows what he's doing. Yeah. And it's only after the fact that kind of me being consistent and mm. giving myself time and developing my own physique have I then realized okay actually I can achieve more than I thought I could yeah and I think a lot of us yeah we we just get so caught up in the short term and what's happening now and don't yeah. really look at the bigger picture and that that I think for a lot of people is what kills like their physique career or bodybuilding career in that they just get frustrated because it is a long man sport yeah like you don't be the best bodybuilder you can be in the first 10 years it's mm. more like the after 30 years of lifting yeah. you look at people like jeff alberts yeah who are incredible like it's it's and, insane like how yeah. how like well he's done and then then you look at someone like alberto nunez like he's like okay i'm, I'm doing a five-year bulk and it's like that's the yeah. that's perspective like most people it's like oh well I, will i even be lifting in five years he's like yep i'll be i'll be like x amount of kilos and my stage weight will go up by four pounds or whatever it is like that that is that's like long term perspective. Yeah. And that's partly why I love bodybuilding because mm. it, it develops those characteristics. Yeah. Like uh, patience. Like it is literally like the the real thing that is delayed gratification. Yeah. Is that is literally what bodybuilding is all about. You you have to go through periods of I always call it like the cost of doing business. Yeah. Gaining fat whilst you're bulking fat is part like that's the cost of building muscle yeah. and then when you you get to spend later on and you chop off that fat and you reveal the muscle yeah um, but that's delayed gratification you can't look shredded like on what's going um but actually to, to come back to your question the only thing that actually scuppers me in terms of progressing things is i still suffer from uh it's called edema so oh, i yeah, get lots yeah. of water attention yeah. Uh, because of my kind of poor ability is that to shuffle electrolytes. Because I study um, podiatry a at university, so it's we st we get a lot of patients with edema, and we get like a okay, yeah, like a, a ton, and it's mostly it's um, mostly it's just normally edema. We do get like lymphedema as well. That's what most amos has as well. So that's crazy that that ties in. But how how does that work for you? Because is it mainly what I was asking is is it mainly your lower legs or like? 
So yeah, it's all associated in, in it's weird. It's in my feet and ankles. Yeah, so yeah. I can wake up and walk and feel like my feet Heaviness. are like waterlogged. Yeah. 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 Oh, that's crazy. So do you, how do you it doesn't, go about treating that? Like how do, how do you find, how does that affect your lifting? So it, it's interesting because I have spoken to experts and I've seen endocrinologists yeah. and they're all like not got an idea. They yeah, just really? they've suggested things and it never seems to, I've not found a solution to controlling it. It yeah. comes, it goes, it's yeah. kind of, I almost relate it to like a period yeah. for a female. Like it just goes through cycles. Right. It just comes around. I get this water attention. Do you find it uh, comes, it goes like on a weekly basis or is it like hourly or? So it's more like, it's actually more like monthly probably. Really? Um, yeah, it's like yeah. I'll have edema for about a week and then it will kind of go and then it will come back like another month later and it will just hang around. Wow, wow that's fascinating. But I feel like you would really only... enjoy talking to Mo as well because you guys probably relate on oh. that. Yeah, Yeah. I mean, the, the thing that throws off for me is it doesn't cause pain. It's yeah. just uncomfortable and it yeah. doesn't yeah. look great. It's just like what the, it throws... the mental thing of it. So yeah, it's mental and also it throws off my scale weight mm -hmm. and because that's something I use to progress like my calories when I'm trying to gain weight, I can gain yeah. like three, four pounds because of the edema. Yeah. And sometimes I'm not sure if it's the edema or if it's because I'm getting too fat and it's kind of yeah. like, that's where I've exactly. become it's really good at trusting the process. Yeah. And so that's something that's helped me coach my clients because I'm like, if I can trust the process, you can trust it because you haven't yeah. got this other weird variable yeah. going on. <laughs> and it's like, that's one thing that like, I think is so crazy. It's, it's so insane how calories are a thing. Like that just still, it still blows my mind. And like how you can just be like, okay, I've been, I've been consistently on two, 200 or whatever. And it's like, you know, like, okay, it's gone up four pounds all of a sudden. Is that because of edema? And then it's like, you need to think about, and there's all these things. It's like, I think it's so fascinating how, We've almost got it. We pretty much do have it down to a science now. It's like yeah, you can pretty much ninety percent of the time. Like if you put someone on, you figure out their maintenance, then you increase. It's like they're gonna gain weight. It's like that's just how it is, and it's, that yeah. is that blows my fucking mind because it's like for me, it's like I thought a year and a half ago or whenever, like when I thought I'd reached my genetic peak. It's like <coughs> I thought that. Oh no! I just must burn all the calories I ate because I was I was eating a fuck ton. I still eat a fuck ton, but I ate a fuck ton more. And it's like like I d I have to do all these strategies. Like I'll have a smoothie and put olive oil in it, and like all nice. this all <laughs> this like fuck. It's why does my body? But oh my god! I think I maybe maybe it's too much caffeine. I don't know. I think I just <laughs> I just demolish calories. Anything you put in me, it's just like goddamn. But how do you how do you find like being able to measure like has sort of helped it. So having an awareness of the variables that can impact scale weight has really helped. And that's something mm. because I've had to become aware of that for my own physique. It's yeah. something I'm very aware of for clients. Yeah. So it's things they, they don't even think about it. Like the, yeah. the, the fact that females don't know that much about their periods is yeah. crazy to me. Like I probably know more yeah. about a lot of female periods than they, they're, yeah. they know, which is insane. And I've had to learn that because yeah. it impacts what I try and do with them. Yeah. But it's things like, even down to like sodium intake. So if you ate like uh, out one night and then you weigh in the next day, you're probably going to weigh more because maybe you ate pizza and it's got way more sodium than your yeah. typical like whatever you might eat in the evening. Yeah. But even down to like medication. So if you start taking like an NSAID, uh, that can lead to water retention environment. Yeah. So if the, the change in temperature suddenly like rises or goes down, yeah. that can lead to the body holding on to more. And then there's things like if you're going through highly damaging training and you're getting DOMS, yeah. that can lead to inflammation, water really? retention associated with that. And then there's things like just high cortisol levels. So if you're mm. really, really stressed, you've got exams maybe, mm. that leads to an associated water Ooh. retention. So there's so many things. There's so many variables. To, yeah. So that, that when people say throw out the scale, I understand because it can be highly frustrating when mm. you don't understand everything else mm. that could be impacting it. But when you know that stuff, then mm. the scale can be valuable again because you can be yeah. like, okay, this, 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 that could explain it. Yeah. Let's keep going. Like for me, I think the scale, especially in my case, because I've literally been, it's been a straight, it's been a straight upwards climb from 52 kilos. I've never cut. I've never. Right. And for me, the the only thing that I can measure on is because looking in the mirror, I can't, I, you can't, I can't tell the changes day to day because I'm not, yeah. I'm not losing fat. My body fat seems to stay relatively consistent. I'm almost looking to gain body fat. Like I'm always right, yeah. like, that's a good sign. Like, 
And it's pretty much like the scale for me is the only way that I can really say like, okay, cool. I've consistently weighed in at 71 now. Let's hit 72 three times in a row. Like that's pretty much it. And then like, that's pretty much the only, the only way that I can measure it. Cause I, I think like for me, I don't fluctuate. My weight doesn't seem to fluctuate too, too much. Okay. Except of like, say if I go out drinking, cause I'm still a student, you know, go out on the town, like that, that can really, really make it fluctuate. So I mean, that's like the only thing that I can really think of. There's mm-hmm. nothing else that I, unless I eat like nothing in the day and I'm just like, let's say if I'm really, really stressed about exams, I just hate eating for some reason. Maybe I'm like a messed up lad, but I just, I, eating frustrates me. The, the only way I can do it yeah. is if it's like t- tastes really, really good or something or like, yeah. Could we touch on um, basically how, because this is fascinating to me, how, how do periods, can we like, if there's a girls listening and they're, they're like, what the fuck, what are you talking about with like periods and water weight? How does that sort of work? Just like if you want to give like a brief explanation. See, I mean, I don't know it anywhere near as well as someone like Lyle McDonald might. Um, he literally spent years producing, I think it's called The Women's Book, yeah. which is like an insane resource. So if there are yeah. female listeners, I would recommend reading that. Yeah. But the bare bones basics in terms of water weight fluctuations is that, yeah. I mean, typical, you think of a 28 day cycle, so yeah. roughly a month. Uh, but different women can have different lengths yeah. and every single woman woman sorry reacts differently so some yeah. find that it really impacts their training when they're on pms yeah. and they get like massive cravings whereas others don't get that yeah and so you sometimes can take that into consideration for training maybe you take a deload during yeah. a period of time that they're on their kind of um, pms t- time yeah uh, and then also there's kind of two phases so you have like the luteal and the follicular phase yeah and you have like for like a week of each so there's like two halves to the luteal two halves to the follicular yeah um but the main thing that impacts scale weight is during pms when they're kind of it's coming on that's when water retention can be really high and they can yeah. gain like up to five pounds like quite easily yeah. of water weight yeah. just holding on to that Fuck. and they can be really moody really like feeling low on energy yeah. they don't want to go train they want to just like they have cravings that are high yeah um and then like different people react differently yeah. to that so most of my female clients luckily don't get that very bad but i've even had clients where it could be normally not bad and then one month it's just like yeah it's just absolutely really hard. bad and then like yeah in that situation if it was like if you think a deload could be a good idea do you think a deload it'd be a great idea to schedule a deload then just because like you can just let them like just sort of like not have to add that stress no 100 percent. it yeah. can it can work really well if if they know themselves that well mm. to then schedule it in there or have mm. like a reactive deload to take it when it's coming yeah. because what leads after that is generally a period of time where water weight is lower yeah. where they have lower cravings but mm. they have good energy levels so it kind of focuses that yeah, yeah. they can then yeah. train hard they get their like good cool. great week after that yeah the main implication that i've drawn from that is that where males you can compare maybe every week or every other week their yeah. scale weight for females you almost have to look every month right. because it's reflective of the time that they're right. they are in that right. kind of cycle and so if that's yeah. like if you're comparing um if you're comparing weekly it can be like five pounds different like from one week to another and that's like that's a decent amount of weight they lose their head yeah they're like oh my god no yeah. i'm going the wrong way uh and that's like i feel like that would be like for me, if I, if I fluctuated by two kilos, like if I go to the gym today and I weigh in at 69 kilos, I'd be like, oh my God. Like, I'd be like, what, how? Like, and that that's only like two kilos different. And I'd just be like, that's literally all. But I feel like, do you find, that's also another question I was going to ask is, how do you find and when do you think it's best to look at mirrors versus looking at pure scale weight? <laughs> Thing you talked about i just want to oh okay it's just fine yeah kind of talked about weighing in at the gym yeah and i think this is something some people do wrong as well in that they don't have consistency in how they can weigh in yeah so even if you weigh in on two different scales yeah like a scale could that scale could be different to this yeah. scale i weigh like know. 76 kilos on one on the scale we have at home and i, I just know that's not true maybe it is but uh, i'm gonna go on the gym i just do this gym one every time 
in reality, that's the key. It's keeping yeah. a consistent measure, measure so you know if it's going up or coming down or yeah. staying the same. That's all we worry about. Yeah. And then because there's daily fluctuations in that our lifestyle is different, we could have fluctuations in water weight. Yeah. I like to see people weigh in regularly through the week. So every day if they can or a minimum of four times. And then I take an average for that week. And then I compare yeah. averages of weeks to weeks. Yeah. Um, because that gives us better data yeah. because you'll get people who will weigh in like you said on different scales and they think oh I weighed in like they think every scale weighs the same so like oh this scale says I'm yeah. two kilos less so I've actually lost two kilos it's like well no you just went and on they a go on the scale other, they go on the other scale again and they're like oh how'd I gain two kilos yeah. and then yeah like that can be or stressful or like and I always say like do it after going to a bathroom before yeah. you drink or eat because these things can impact it yeah. and that because you'll get people weighing in at last thing at night and you're yeah. like well it depends what you just ate yeah. <laughs> like that's going to impact it a lot so yeah that's with the scale i think it, people get that fundamentally wrong sometimes yeah um, and can scuff their progress but in terms of when to not focus on the scale and focus on other things i think you should always use all your tools in combination so i like to take circumference measurements like every month Mm. And I, I tend to get photos every week or every month, depending if people are gaining muscle or losing fat. Yeah. Um, and then also like, yeah, looking at yourself as well as like thinking about performance in the gym. So if, if there's kind of, I always think like if everything is going in the right direction, great. If yeah. most things are going in the right, right direction, great. If yeah. half and half, like then maybe have a look at things. If mm. most things are saying that you're doing the wrong thing, then we need to probably make an adjustment. Yeah. Um, but in terms of when the scale's really not valuable is when basically you're getting very, very lean. So like yeah. for bodybuilding, sports, right. physique prep. Would you then go during those last pure mirrors? Exactly. Yeah. Um, I always say this to competitors. It's like the body, the, the actual judges don't care what body fat percentage you are. They right. don't care how much you weigh. You're in the right like, division for your class. All yeah. they care about and all they're judging you on is how you look. Yeah. So that's the most important thing to focus on every single day is how you're looking mm. because and i say this to clients at any time it's like if the scale had gone in a different direction or told you something else would yeah. you be happier despite looking worse no yeah. so you yeah. actually look good the scale's not saying what you want it to which is fine because the most important thing is how you're looking that's what we actually care about mm. so that's when i more so focus on kind of visuals how people are looking is definitely in their latter, latter stages towards yeah. kind of getting towards the stage because Especially like I talked about, like cortisol's going all over the place. They might be having refeeds, um, so it's just not useful. And when we're thinking about fat loss, the percentage of loss or the percentage of weight that's being reflected on the scale that's fat is less and less because their yeah. body fat percentage less and is less and less. Yeah. So we're actually trying to measure like tiny degrees of fat loss yeah. um, by the time you're edging towards stage. So it's just almost it's almost a bit so hard to they, a fluctuation of water weight can be can almost outweigh it yeah it can mask it easily yeah, yeah and then you can't really even even over weekly sort of weigh-ins it's still like still hard to sort of tell yeah so yeah. even at that time i end up comparing by week uh, yeah. every other week yeah. or even monthly so sometimes you still like, weigh every day and then compare the months that's right. what i tend to do yeah right sweet sweet so could we touch on how <clears throat> Say if, because I know, was it for episode 100, you did a round table? Yes. Yes, yes. So for that, and for like something like that, where you have multiple experts, or, you, or say if it's you and an expert, how, how do you personally, this is not really, so if you're a bodybuilder, it's probably going to, we might have one more bodybuilding related question on, but this is going to be very content, probably related from here. What would be your main like, how do you go about facilitating positive conversation and positive debate? Because I've been, as I said before we started, um, I've been consuming a lot of Jordan Peterson's content and Joe Rogan's content. And I think the thing that I admire about them so much is <clears throat> what they do so well is they allow room for, okay, shit, I'm wrong. Or, okay, no, I don't agree with you. No, and then it's not like a, fuck you, I don't agree with you. It's like, hey, no, I have a different opinion, this is why I hold it, et cetera, et cetera. And I assume a, good, a, a way that Eric Helms explained it in the bodybuilding world yesterday was he basically said, most for the most part, people like him and Mike Israel, like all them, they'll have very, very similar views to a certain point. But then basically he describes it as, 
where the evidence is not there, where like the outer limits of the evidence are, um, that's where their disagreements lie, or like <coughs> things evidence cannot, things e- evidence based practice cannot sort of tell you. Like, yeah, can't even think of an example. Um, but basically, things things that you cannot get from a journal article. Um, how do you go about facilitating positive conversation and like constructive positive conversation between ex- experts and even just between yourself and an expert? So I think it's important, like you said, I think, and I think Eric has quoted this before, where yeah. um, the principles are always in place. Yeah. But practitioners sometimes have different methods. <clears throat> it's kind of like there's many like roads to Rome. That's like the, yeah. the saying. And I completely see that. And as someone who interviews loads of experts, yeah. I end up hearing about these different methods. Yeah. And it's just about relating them back to principles and rem- reminding the audience of that. Because I think that's sometimes where it gets lost. Yeah. Unfortunately, the experts I interviewed, so like Minna Henselmans, Mike Isertel, and Eric Helms, yeah. they're all great people yeah. <laughs> in that they yeah. aren't dogmatic, they're evidence-based, mm. they're very open-minded. And that they're all cha- they've all changed their opinions yeah, over time, and they they're all, all they always changing. If you say, "Hey, I don't know though," and then like, if you question their beliefs, they're not going to be like, "Fuck you, why?" It's not like a exactly. It's not an attack on their personality or their character. Exactly, they actually invite it. So, yeah, yeah. so like I know Mike actually likes challenging questions because it makes him think. Because sometimes it's a question that then spawns an answer that develops a new theory or concept for him. Yeah. Whereas I think some people can get very dogmatic in their ways and they're almost selling on crap, which you see yeah. in the fitness industry yeah. all the time. And once you've done that, there's no returning. Yeah. Like once you've once sold you say, crap, you have to fasting continue. is the number one. You can't do anything else. It's hard to exactly. go back and say to your followers like, oh, no, nah, but it depends. Like it's like if if you've if you've sold your five hundred k subs on that, you, it's it's hard to go back and be like, oh nah, it sort of depends with pretty much everything, and it's 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 never really black and white. Would you say? Like would you say? No. It's, yeah. Yeah. Exactly. It's and that's for unfortunate. That's I mean I don't tend to bring on people that would be that way. Yeah. Um, but if there is ever, I mean sometimes I'll be talking to guests who I don't know everything about their subject matter and their opinion on everything. So for yeah. example, Dan Pardy, he came on and talked about sleep. Yeah. I'm familiar with some of his stuff, but not all of it. Mm. And he would said some things that to me were a bit maybe controversial and maybe I wasn't yeah. completely sure about. Yeah. But as an interviewer, they're the expert. Mm. I'm mm. just listening and I'm just trying to get out information from yeah. them. So I just am very respectful of their opinions. Yeah. And I don't try, unless they invite challenge, I don't yeah. try and like challenge them directly. Yeah. Um, I just would get them to explain why yeah. they've come to that then more than anything. Give rationale to their viewpoint. Like say mm-hmm. if, if I had someone like Jordan Peterson on, right? In my opinion, I think he's a hyper intelligent man. And for me to try and debate him on things of like politics. No, like I don't know shit. I'm a 19 year old. Like I don't even have life experience. It's like, that's just, it, it, it's, it would always be irrational. Or like if I tried to debate someone, it's just, yeah. And I think that's probably the smartest way to go about it because you get to, you get to get their opinion. You get to say, okay, cool. How, how does that work? How, how do you believe that? Why do you believe that? Et cetera. And I think it's, I think it's hard to do. Do you find, do you ever find, this is more like a question just me to you, but like, it'll probably be still be in the podcast though. But um, do you find how, what do you think constitutes a good question? Because I think a lot of the bigger podcasters, um, a lot of the ones that sort of, I don't want to like be like, I don't want to dog anyone, but say like they already had a voice or they already had an audience before they podcasted. Like mm-hmm. Joe Rogan, for example, he wasn't that famous. You, most people don't know about him. I think he's a genius podcaster because he can facilitate that positive conversation. He knows interesting questions. He doesn't ask boring questions. How, how, do, you, how do you personally go about think, thinking like, okay, is this a good question? Is this an interesting question? Should I ask this? So I think my podcast is quite different to someone like Joe's in that I'm getting on experts to either talk about research that they've done personally yeah. or um, talk about their area of expertise. Yeah. So it's almost like 
the questions I've got are just trying to draw knowledge on what they already know very well. Yeah. However, there does become an element where there's times I go off script where I don't even ask the questions I am planning to exactly. because yeah. I am immersed in the arena of bodybuilding and I know of different camps and I know yeah. different opinions. And so when I hear something, it makes me want to dig. And so I do. Yeah. And basically because my audience are probably like me in yeah. many ways and they kind of want to hear what I hear and what I want to hear. Yeah. So that's where I go with it. Um, so I end up asking questions either like the audience have asked these questions or yeah. I've seen controversy, controversy yeah. in our niche. And so I choose that to then explore with an expert yeah. uh, because I think oftentimes there are things that end up becoming like uh, – what they're called um gimmicks uh, yeah, yeah. out in 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 the in the fitness community right. but for a time like fads. people are like that's some, yeah, yeah, yeah fads and yeah. that's something i have to do yeah. so i love picking those fads and, and being saying, like why right, mike like is what is there any anything legit towards this and yeah. then here just com normally here completely destroy it and yeah. destroy so many hopes and dreams <laughs> but it's like that's so refreshing so like incredibly smart you, like, to just the destroy perspective it. of like hey again like it's not black and white Sadly, it's not like cool if it was. If, if intermittent fasting was really the best way, or whatever, like it's 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 sort of like it depends. Like maybe it's good for some people. It's a good tool, but like I think it's like everything is a tool, and some things mm -hmm. are trash. Like some things are just completely useless. But I think most things, hopefully, I'd say nowadays, like most things, I think have some some sort of point where they would be useful, and I hope, like in the sort of bodybuilding community, I think especially with people like yourself and people like AJ, 3DMJ, Mike Isretel, Omar Isof, Jeff Nippard, like people are like, there's actual education going on. It's not like, mm -hmm. do the six chest exercises and you'll get shredded. Like, it's not so like, it's almost like people are pretty much moving away from the bro science. No one's, I hope so. And like, even my friends in the gym, right? Like most of them, they're not going to do their research. They're not going to listen to podcasts like yours. Like they're not going to, they'll just watch the biggest YouTubers or Gymshark yeah. YouTubers, et cetera. Like, and they'll just see, and most of them are like steroided up. So it's like, you know, but like, even I find them are getting a little more educated and a lot of them will come to me and they'll be like, Oh, you know, but the, the, they'll still have the whole thing of like, okay, no, James, you need to do three second eccentrics on the last rep because X, Y, and Z. And I'm, I guarantee they've just seen it on any YouTube video. And then I don't, there still is things like that, but I think it's, it's mm -hmm. definitely like I, I'm, when I go into my gym, I'm seeing good form for the most part. The only thing nice. I, the only thing that I don't see that I, that I, that pisses me off is lat pull down. I see so much like where they drag, Jerking. they're dragging it to their knees instead of like the oh. clavicular. And it's like, yeah fuck's sake but you know what can you do but yeah yeah i think evidence-based practice is i think it's, it's really difficult for me because i've seen people for the most part it's really positive what's happening yeah there are still pub med there's now pub med warriors you might call them right. where it's like if you haven't got a study to back <laughs> up what you're saying you're wrong yeah and it's like I'm not sure about that. Yeah, it's not, and then there's yeah, like if it, the, if it can't be measured, mind. then yeah. But then you've still got the the bros who are drawing upon anecdote from yeah, genetic yeah. freaks, yeah. and it's like, well, yeah, not, that works for him because yeah. anything fucking works for him. <laughs> he could like and sneeze and gain muscle, like exactly. Literally. And then you've still got I've seen a research like a growth of maybe these bros who are now legitimizing their stuff with science. Yeah. But the science they're drawing upon is basically bullshit or yeah. there's like it's cherry picked or yeah. it's done on like a really weird species of mice. Yeah. Uh, and they're, they're drawing upon that to then give themselves like this evidence based seal. Yeah. Yeah. And re really it's the evidence plus your practice and then using that to your best of your ability on the individual. Yeah. And not many people seem to be truly doing that. And people are giving them this evidence-based stamp on their like Instagram profile if they like have read one study on PubMed and it's like, well, or yeah. listen to Alan Aragon or something is Yeah. A lot of people have a misunderstanding of what that truly means. Yeah. And like understanding like how because like say for myself, I'm doing papers at university that sort of help me understand the one that we're doing is kind of shit. It's 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 trash paper. 
if anyone here listening goes to AUT and you do more, I'm sorry, like Jesus Christ. But it's it's just, and but I think it gives me a little bit of an understanding. But it's still like for the majority of people to understand a journal article, it's not that easy. And like mm-hmm. you, you cannot just say, oh, this one isolated study said X was the best, right? Like it hasn't. It it's kind of hard for one, like unless it's really comprehensive and there's like it's been cited a billion times everyone basically is behind it it's kind of like you can't take it like that and i think um a good a good thing that eric said yesterday was he said basically the intersection of experience and evidence based and that yes. can like fill in the gaps it's like you, some things can't be measured and that's yeah. like i think that's an important aspect to take into account because you, if, if you can't measure it but people the best bodybuilders in the world and the most the ones that are obviously getting the results at the highest level they will all do it and it all seems to work for them then i think there must be something behind it but maybe it maybe it's trash but for most for the most part i'd say hopefully there's hopefully there'll be something to back it up one day and i think the key thing is and something I try and do with all my clients is realizing you're not like everyone else. So mm. stop comparing yourself to everyone else all yeah. the time. Yeah. And it's so easy to do and get caught up in on social media, just comparing yeah. your lifts to other people or your physique to them. Yeah. But we're so like, no one's a special snowflake, but yeah. actually everyone is. Yeah. Because yes, the overall principles are the same for everyone, but that individual difference is there and that and does actually count important. for a fair bit yeah no totally yeah uh, and i think people forget that they're like yeah. oh no i have to follow like whatever it might be the generic rule of thumb for hypertrophy is 10 sets yeah. per muscle group yeah i have to be doing that for every single muscle group and yeah. it's like well you might need less than that yeah you might benefit from less than that yeah you're getting trashed at the moment doing yeah. stupid high volumes why yeah. are you doing yeah. that it's like well but like, volume's king it's like yeah yeah but no <laughs> yeah. and then that's like i feel like that's incredibly important that i found for me is when I dropped my volume, I thought, I thought like, no, like get in there, do all the volume. And then like recently, like once I listened, it was your um, volume round, round table actually, where basically I, I like, I like went in there and I was like, why, why am I doing this much volume? What is the rationale behind it? Do I want to be dead at the end of every workout? Do, and then I realized like, okay, I can do four or five exercises, three or four sets each. And then, I'll still be equally fucked, but it's like, I won't, I will be able to put more into every single set that I do and every single rep. And there's no, Mm -hmm. there's a lot less reps where it's like, okay, let me momentum this up. Like there's a lot less of that. And it's like, I'm finding basically what I've been doing is I I find it hard to do consistent progressive overload on flat bench, just get upper back issues. So I'm finding my incline dumbbell has just been going like this. And it's just ever since I've been basically saying, okay, you get like basically like a 10 minute wait between sets. Like you can just sit there and do like, and basically what you're doing is you're waiting for each set and you're waiting like, okay, you must go as basically as hard as possible as you can with good form. And like Mm -hmm. learning that from people like you and people like Alberto and people like, especially the one who started off with me was Josh Bridgman. He was a podcast guest. He's a UK, right. he's a UK um, physique competitor, natural physique competitor, yeah. and sort of just seeing that like how how king form is and how like you if if your volume's all trash, then like why why you know, and that's like a thing that I think most people don't take into account. And like people like my mates who like I'll gym with, they they don't think that they sort of think, nah, bro, you're a pussy if you don't go hard, and it's like they just want to do oh yeah drop set quick and now like 21s or like the, that, that bicep kill thing yeah. you half and yeah that shit pisses me off because it's like they say no nah, it's the best and then i'm like but like i have wrist injuries as well so it's like that feels shite for my wrist yeah and the only thing like i can find for biceps is like hammer curls where you go like you like end up supinated i believe supinated is the right word end up like that yeah and it's sort of like I feel like it's all it's all very very subjective of what is the best for you, and I really like no yeah that's your where approach. sorry I really like your approach of like being like okay there there's so much gray like there's so much yeah 
No, totally. And you're completely right. And Josh is completely right that technique comes like that is the foundation before any sort of training. Um, Unfortunately, I think a lot of us get into the gym without that foundation and we learn it later, which is certainly something I've had to do. Uh, And I've incurred injuries along the way because of it. And this is why this sort of podcast and you reaching a younger audience is brilliant because now they know, okay, like I just need to hone in technique. And in fact, when you are less advanced you don't have to go as hard yeah because it, you don't need a, such a, a large stimulus and large stress to grow yeah. because you haven't been training that much yeah. whereas when you are more advanced you better sure have good technique because yeah. you have to go very very hard at mm. times to see that growth yeah um so no that's super important and a lot of people equate kind of how hard something feels with yeah, how hard definitely. something is and how good a result it's going to bring yeah, it's like yeah. okay the more hungry and tired i am the better the diet or the yeah. the, the more trashed by the end of the workout yeah. the better the workout yeah. and it's like well no yeah. it doesn't work like that <laughs> it's kind of like it's that's just because it's harder mentally that does not mean you get gonna get better results like yeah doing doing a two-hour run at maximum it's like i used to be a distance runner um, if you do a two hour run at like your race pace every week, that's going to be hard, but <clears throat> you're just going to trash your body. And it's like, yeah, that's just, that's just how it works. So you're just going to sh- fuck yourself up. And it's like, I really like the <clears throat> balanced approach of sort of being like, it's, it's not like necessarily the hardest thing is it? it's, it's never really like, it's like not almost like if you think about pretty much anything, like with lifting it's never really the case like maybe it's going to be the best thing maybe incredibly strenuous but it won't be the hardest thing you can always make things harder like say with bench press if i wanted to make things harder i could not place my feet on the ground but does that make it better probably not like yeah, there's, there's lots of things you can put like you can put a 5 kg plate on one side and not the other like there's all this shit you can do but that doesn't yeah. necessarily make it better or make it more productive for your time mm-hmm. no i totally agree yeah could we finish off with this what would be your main advice for someone looking to educate themselves in the gym they're looking to like they sort of they they know they're a bro they know just they they eat chicken and broccoli and they love it and all that but they want to educate themselves and find great resources and become they don't want to become an Eric Helms or an Alan Aragon or all that. They just want to become a step above, just a step above the bro side. So they just want to sort right. of educate themselves. Where would be some one great resources and also two great sort of approaches to doing that or great mm-hmm. mindsets. So I think the best thing someone like that can do is not read articles, get into podcasts and things like that. Yeah, Cause I think definitely. they're great, but I think they are, after you get a foundation of knowledge yeah. because I, I love podcasts and I love articles, but normally if you're reading those fresh and you don't really have a basic understanding, you get quite lost and you yeah, end up definitely. just being like um, someone who's chasing yeah. the, the latest thing that's coming out on anything. journal articles. Like especially it's, it's especially if there's like complicated lingo, it's just hard. Like if you don't know the, what the words mean, you don't know what the words mean. Mm-hmm. So what I would recommend is actually finding people like Greg Nichols, Mike Isretel, Eric Helms, uh, Alan Aragon, and actually look at their books and their yeah. resources that they've produced because they've collated all of their great work into yeah. a single resource that's easy to read, easy to digest, like easy for the general pop person yeah. to actually understand and consume. And you're going to get so much from that being in a really like it's a book. So it's written yeah. basically like a textbook. Yeah. And it's like when you're studying at school, you don't just go to like listening random messages and like learning from random texts. You yeah. get a, a textbook and you're that. But I think that's where the foundation is or with actual books, hard books. Yeah, um, I definitely recommend. If I was going to recommend a few books for like people who are interested in the sort of thing that we've been talking about, would be yeah. like the Muscle and Strength Pyramids yeah. with uh, Eric Helms, yeah. Andre, and uh, and Andy actually was producing that one. Yeah. Scientific Principles of Strength Training. So yeah. that's Mike 
um, Israel, and then Greg Nichols has also done. I think it's like the art of lifting. Um, yeah. at his books. I think they're great. And yeah. if you read those, like you already know more than ninety nine percent of the lifters in yeah. your gym. So. Yeah. <laughs> I feel like even just a little, even just a little bit of education can bring all the all the results. Like yeah. even like once you've got the first pyramid, then it's like get the next level, get the next level. I'm just like, <coughs> you don't need. It depends what your goals are, but like you don't, you don't need to be. You don't need to be Eric Helms. You don't need to be because it's like you don't need to be at that sort of level because a, he's a high level coach. Like it's 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 like I don't think, <laughs> yeah. It's like it's like the if you're if you're Gen Pop, like you don't need to put yourself in that stress for like no reason. And I I felt like a year and a half ago, I felt like. I think it was my ego sort of thinking, yeah, I know everything. I've watched so many YouTube videos. And I must know that, oh, fuck, like, God damn it. But, <laughs> you know. But where can people find you online? Where can people find your podcast, your Instagram, if you have a website, all that sort of stuff? Cool. No, I appreciate it. Um, so revivestronger.com is our website. You can find the podcast there. You can, if you wanted kind of coaching, coaching is there. We've got articles on there as well. Um, and some free resources of people interested in that. And then yeah. any other kind of, I don't post anything on Twitter, but like yeah. Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, Revive Stronger is our tag. So if they type that in, they'll be able to find us. And if you want to add me on like on uh, Facebook, I'm Steve Hall. So you'll probably be able to find me. And we have actually a free Facebook group on Facebook um, called revivestronger.com. And that'd be awesome if people want to get into like deep discussion on there. We've got people posting in everyday questions, I think over 3,000 members. So that's really fun. Thank you guys so much for listening to this episode of the Student Side Hustle. I would appreciate so much if you would leave a review. If you'd like to hear more of what I'm saying, then I would love if you would follow me on Instagram or check out my other social media, all linked in the show notes. And again, I would just like to say thank you so much for listening. Have a wonderful evening and study hard.